All right, welcome back everybody, this is GTM. Uh, today's video tutorials are basically gonna be, um, I should say, I'm not sure how many it's gonna take, but it should be about three or four part series of uh, creating um, a still life. So we're gonna cover our basic polygon modeling techniques and later on, eventually, you know, you'll be introduced to a simple tool called soft, soft selection. All right, anyways, uh, first part of this tutorial though, we do have to prep up our images. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, launch up Photoshop. And the images that we're gonna work with, I'm gonna go ahead and open these up. And still life here, let me go to my refs. And I'm gonna open up all these images right here. All right, we'll probably start off, we'll probably start off on the most simplest object being probably the wine bottle. And then we'll work our way up to the wine glass, all the way up to the barrel, and then eventually we will do a, you know, kind of an organic shape. Um, just a, uh, looks like a little green crab apple or some kind of apple. I'm not sure what they're called, what type of apple that is. Just a green apple. All right, so, um, so yeah, basically this is uh, some of the first modeling techniques for my, uh, you know, students here in the uh, game art design class they are you know basically being introduced to modeling all right anyways um this last image here you know let me show the barrel first and then i'm going to open up this uh one image here and i want to break this down to a lot of my intro modelers here now as you can see we have three stages of this barrel you know we have the low poly version right here which you see right here this is the medium version and then of course like a high res version of it where you actually extrude out the details but notice up here in the render they all pretty much virtually look the same and that's just because the illusion of textures so to my students in the game art design program you know make sure um, you know the, the techniques I'm teaching you I'm trying to teach you how to high poly but you got to remember when it comes to low poly, all you're doing is keeping, you know, the same type of object as compared to this one, the high poly, and then compare the low poly to it. You're basically just trying to create the same shape, you know, with obviously with less faces. So just keep that in mind. So, you know, the techniques I'm showing you now will be high poly, but, you know, when you want to convert to like a low poly, just remember you're just trying to create the same object with as minimum, you know, minimal um, geometry as possible. And as you can see, based off these three, they relatively look all the same. So ju just keep that in mind. Hopefully that'll help a little bit, you know, as you go on and, you know, continue to learn how to model, you'll start to, uh, you know, get the hang of low poly versus high poly. All right, um, but let's go ahead and, um, let's go ahead and prop uh, not sure I shouldn't say prop. Uh, let's go ahead and prepare our um, images. Now these images right here that you see, notice that these are ones I found on the web. Kind of resized, you know, as you can see the image size of them are at 72. You don't want to put no 300 res resolution images in there. That's mainly for print. So always convert your images to 72 and maybe give yourself a, you know, a good height and width dimensions, you know, uh, and work in pixels. All right, but you notice all of them have white backgrounds. Now, the reason we grayscale our images is so that we can see our lines against our reference images. So, for example, I'm going to go ahead and launch up 3D Max here. And I will, uh, I'll go back over this, but I'm going to actually put an image in this front viewport. And, you know, how you do that is go by, you go by view, viewport background right here, or it's your alt B is your hotkey. So if I were to click alt B that would pop that open in the background source I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, put one of those images that I have and it's one of the still lifes refs and let's go with the just for example the wine glass so when I open that up I'm gonna go ahead and match the bitmap and lock zoom pan and the reason I lock zoom pan is so we can zoom in and out with our middle mouse alright as you can see the grids up I'm gonna hit G for my grid all right, but look how bright that is. So when I throw down, you know, some geometry, and I'm gonna just throw down a cylinder for now. Notice our edges are really white. So we can't really see, you know, behind the white background. Now, of course, I could turn to smooth, 
you know, and then edges, and then maybe Alt X and work in, you know, work in um, what's it called, uh, X-ray form. But you know, like I said, I, I, you know, it's it's good habit to basically, um, you know, always grayscale your images. So for example, back to where I have, I'm just in, you know, wireframe. We can't really see our you know geometry behind that backdrop and that works for splines too if I were to create lines you know can't really see what I'm painting on and the reason we do that even if I were to change that line a different color to like black you can see it but when I select it it's automatically going to turn white that's one thing that we can't change in max so no matter what when we select an object you know it, it shows up white so it's going to make it hard to kind of see what's going on so and like I said, this is a habit I've always learned was just to always grayscale your images, you know. It's kind of an old technique, and it's been passed down through a lot of video tutorials, you know. So um, let's go ahead and grayscale out our images. And we are going to work with the the wine glass first anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and leave that in there. I'm going to minimize max. All right, so back in Photoshop here, uh, I'm going to take my wine glass. Notice uh, the layer here. Uh, I got the wine glass selected, that image. I'm going to double click and unlock that, press, press OK, and then I'm going to add a layer in Photoshop. Now my layer's on top. Now we'll just double click and name that wine glass just so you can see what's going on. All right, and this layer I'm going to call my gray layer, or just gray, whatever, it don't matter. All right, from there, with that layer selected, I'm going to go to my paint bucket and just click on my color swatch here and pick me a nice kind of a, you know gray color. Press OK, and then I'm just going to fill that in gray with my paint bucket in that layer, and then just go to my blend modes, multiply it, and then from there, I'm just going to file, save as, and I'm going to save it as a JPEG over the old one, which is the wine glass here, by not changing the name. So when I resave over it, this should automatically update in Max. So if it doesn't update here, just kind of minimize and maximize and it'll pop it right up. So there you go. So let's go ahead and do that to all our images. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, you know, click on there, throw a little uh, new layer on top of it and just put a gray fill in there and multiply it. And we are gonna save this as and over the old one. So I'm gonna go JPEG and over the barrel. There we go. And then we are gonna go to our you know, let's create a new layer Pop it in here let's go ahead and multiply it notice I didn't unlock it. it's no big deal as long as we get it grayed out here file save as JPEG let's go over the green apple again save it right over it and then of course our bottle here so actually I said we were gonna model our bottle first so we'll do that so I'm gonna go gray multiply File save as over, I believe, whatever they called it, the Soltis bottle. Sol Solstice, I don't know. We'll save it, press OK, and now all our images have been grayed out. So we're all good to go on here. So I'm going to go ahead and just close out Photoshop and close out all these. We don't no longer need it open. And let's go ahead and replace our, you know, our wine glass with the wine bottle. All right, so I'm going to hit Alt B, or for, for example, I'm going to go back here, uh, Viewport Backgrounds, and we're going to look for the file, which is our Soltis bottle. I'm going to open it up, match bitmap, block zoom pan, and press OK, and this should work. Now, uh, just a fair warning: sometimes when you throw, you know, um, reference images in Max, sometimes Max may tend to get to might have a hiccup and all of a sudden the references aren't matching up so you might have to reset max and re-upload the reference images. Uh, it tends to do that sometimes I don't have the answer for that um, you know it's rare but it, occasionally it does happen so it doesn't mean you have to you know reset everything really just save your file reset max reopen it up and tech, and then reload the images and they should be fine at least from my experience you know alright anyways um, so this is the first model we're gonna eventually work on here 
and uh, that video tutorial was basically letting you know how to prep up your uh, images and like I said I always grayscale out my images uh, it's just a good habit um, especially when you're working with more complex um, you know reference images and blueprints you know cars boats planes robots or whatever you know whatever's drawn all right um, hopefully that helped and uh, we'll see you in the next video when we start working on this bottle all right looks like uh, we're ready to go here I'm gonna go ahead and um, as you can see we got our bottle here I'm gonna hit my middle mouse so I can pan around zoom in and out now remember the video tutorial I posted about your preference settings and why we uh, you know went to our viewport tab configure driver and we set these at the highest and linear linear and of course this is my personal preference I like to enable anti os wires the reason we always do that is so that when you work with references you always get the best quality out of them you know when you work with images you always want your reference images to uh, you know basically be able to zoom in and out and be able to uh, keep the resolution pretty good so you can get the details and stuff and that is why we do that especially when you start working with uh, some serious blueprints on cars or you know model sheets you want your stuff to come in clear as possible all right now let's uh, look at this bottle here I'm alt W now like I said this bottle I mean obviously it's it looks like a simple object and to be honest it really is I mean there's a thousand of, I don't want to say a thousand of ways but there's you know I can think of about five six different ways we can model this bottle right off the bat you know and when it comes to 3d max I'm not you know not saying my method is the best method out there I'm just letting you know it's a method that I've always that I had kind of adapted to and um, the methods I'm teaching you, um, hopefully uh, they somewhat make sense as you go. But the reason I teach it this way is so when it comes to more complex objects like a character, um, you know, a humanoid character, or, you know, maybe like it's some kind of a mammal, animal of some sort, uh, the technique I'm going to show you um, easily translates to those situations. Because the way I look at it is if I can get you to model a, wa a wine bottle, let alone like wine glass, a barrel. If I can get you to model it the way I do it, then I can get you to model, you know, the beginning stages of a character. I mean, you know, if you look at it, everything's in shapes. You gotta start looking 3D in shapes. This wine bottle is nothing but a cylinder. So, you know, the ankle of a character is a cylinder. To the cab, to the leg, the thigh is a cylinder. Um, you know, fingers, digits, necks, they're all cylinders, you know. Uh, think of a body of a, you know, let's say a dolphin, you know, that's nothing but more than a cylinder, you know, that you tweak out and shape up to look like a dolphin. So the techniques I'm going to show you here um, is the technique I always you always do to prep up my uh, geometry. So whatever, you know, in most cases. All right, so for example here, let's go ahead and get, uh, let's lay down our first geometry down. So I'm going to go ahead and go to my shapes here standard perimeters geometry right here I'm gonna to go to cylinder because basically that's all this is I'm gonna lay down a cylinder click raise it up and then obviously it's really small up here so it's alright though I'm gonna hit F4 now the trick to modeling is that uh, you don't want to get in the habit of um, always starting off heavy a lot of uh, intro modelers uh, like a lot of my students and other people I've seen or worked with before, you know, before I even came in and was able to help them out, always, you know, you have a bad habit of starting off with a dense object. The whole idea of, uh, you know, modeling is uh, you start off with less. It's always easier to cut into or, you know, create more edges and shapes than it is to take away. And, you know, you're just dealing with less verts and edges. I mean, look how many edges right al uh, alone that we're looking at right now. That's just a lot to work with and verts and stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, prep up our object here. And this is just my style, you know. Uh, first things first, I'm going to rechange the, you know, the basic size of the, you know, the parameter setting. So I'm going to go to modify. And we don't need 18 sides. I'm going to go 8 sides. And the reason I do eight sides is because if you look at it, it's split in half. You know, it, this is going to show you when it comes to modeling a lot. You you know, maybe not on a bottle, but when it comes to a character, 
you want to be able to, um, you know, symmetry a lot of it. So you want to be able to have a line that's somewhat down the center of your object. And the eight-sided cylinder does that. All right, uh, next thing is the height segment. So I'm only going to go to a three. We don't need that much. Three is good to work with. And our cap segments just have one. That's fine. And like I said, from here, if I were to scale this, remember I was mentioning to scale from the uniform. So when you highlight yellow, not up here, you highlight the yellow, you scale. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and Z up on everything. So when you work, the rule is just constantly be aware of what's going on. I get a lot of uh, students at the beginning, and they're like, why does my bottle look all crazy? You know, it's because when you uniform scale, make sure you're scaling uniformly. I get a lot of students or people that first start off, they start scaling, and they look how it starts to skew, and it screws up your geometry. So be aware. Always pay attention to your four viewports. I mean, you know, when you're working. I mean, of course, we're going to Alt-W zoom in and out back and forth but just constantly check back and forth at all your four viewports to see if things are getting out of whack you know all right so i'm going to go ahead and uh hit my see that grid i'm gonna hit my g to get rid of that and then this is just a habit i always do i'm gonna prep up my object so i'm going to convert this to a poly which is either selecting the object right click edible poly or you can you know select on it right click and then convert to edible poly from there and that works just as well alright the next step is uh, let's break this down a little bit you know what we're looking at here alright we are in edible poly form now when it comes to polygon modeling to be honest uh, one of the most highly used modeling techniques throughout the industry if you can master polygon modeling you can pretty much model anything and you know eventually uh, you know, when you get used to polygon modeling, a lot of polygon modelers will take their, you know, their objects or their, their base form, you know, if it's a character, they'll take them in the mud box or ZBrush and detail it out and so forth. Uh, but the rule is normally when you're done and completely satisfied with uh, your model, and when it's done, you right click it and convert it to a mesh. That way it's easier on the processor, it's a lighter geometry. Even though a mesh and a poly, look exactly the same which is so great about that so if I were to convert this to a mesh looks the same different tool sets convert, convert it back to a poly so you know there's really nothing happens or doesn't jack up the geometry only one other way it does and that's when you're in ice ice line you know displays and I'll explain that later all right um okay so let's talk uh, let's break this down a little bit here I'm click. Uh, by the way, I hit Alt W. I'm gonna click on this object here, and notice uh, it's an edible polyform. So you hit this little plus sign. This is your sub object level. You hit the little plus sign. You have the sub object of that polygon or that poly you know, geometry. You have your vertexes, which are these blue little dots or points. Those are your vertexes. Notice if I hit my move, you know, select and move, I can move that vertex, manipulate it. Uh, control it you know if I go on the world axis which is the uh, you know I can move it around all right and those are your verts uh, notice up even if I move through here I can use my marquee tool and just highlight through select verts highlight through again select verts one thing I want to explain though is this ignore back basin now if you check that and if I highlight through, I'm only getting the faces in front. It's not selecting the ones in the back. So be familiar with this. Uh, you will be using this quite a bit. Um, think about it as in if uh, you're working on a face, a character's face. And obviously you got verts in the back of the head. And you got the eyes that have verts. And you're trying to work with the eye sockets or something. And you start selecting verts. You don't want to accidentally select the verts behind his head. Next thing you know, you got eyes that are shaped out, or you know, verts that look like he's got eyes in the back of his head, or something. Well, hopefully, that made sense. But yeah, that's why you have ignore back facing. So be familiar with it. Normally, we're going to work out off it, you know, with it off, not checked, is what I'm saying. Uh, there will be times where we will definitely check it though. All right, so that's our verts. Then we have our edges. These are edges. Now, a couple of tech, uh, techniques I want to explain a little bit is uh, if I grab that edge here, 
notice these four right here and those four the shrink the grow ring and loop will always be the top tool set of tools within your polygon mode or edible poly I should say so vertex you see shrink grow you got edge you got your shrink grow you got your borders you got your shrink grow polygon form shrink grow and then of course elements your shrink grow be familiar with this little section because uh, you know your shrink grow ring and loop so watch what I mean or watch what I'm about to explain it now so if I were to grab an edge and if I select one edge that one little edge you see it's highlighted red if I ring it it rings it all the way down all right so I'm do that again I'm gonna hit edge ring now if I hit edge loop it'll follow the path so if I loop it it loops it all the way around all right um, let's try that again I'm gonna hit the edge loop and it loops it all right now think of it this way too I can actually get multiple edges at one time so if I want to grab this edge and this edge by holding down control so I'm selecting it holding down control selecting this edge I can loop it and loops them simultaneously now I want to explain this if I grab this edge and I try to hit loop notice it does not loop the reason why you can only loop an edge if it has an edge on opposite sides of it so for example this edge if I loop it I can because it has this edge here and this edge here but notice this edge if I try to loop it I can't because it doesn't have another edge to loop with it it only has the one below it so in a lot of cases if I were to grab this poly you know I'm just in polygon form I'm selecting that face I'm gonna just put a quick inset in here and you know I'll explain these a lot later but you know uh, I'm just set an inset hit OK notice now we have an edge here on the opposite side so if I were to grab that edge I could loop it now just keep that in mind uh, you'll be using that technique a lot I wanted to explain it so alright so let's go back with a control Z keep it our base form so so far we learned about our vertexes and then our edges now uh, we'll go to border last when we go to polygon this is our polygon that's one face now your polygon remember your polys are tries it takes two tries to make a square so in the game world technically you know um, polygons you know a try is considered a polygon you know um, so for example this right here if I select that sphere if I hit 7 on my keyboard notice it says it's 26 polys you know you so you, I technically you know I think you gotta multiply that by 2 or something but um, also if you want to check your polygon count if you go to your hammer your utilities go to more you got something called polygon counter if I press OK notice we have if I select it we are counting the tries right here so it says the budget or the current object selected has 60 tries if I come here and go to polygons you can see it's 26 polygons right so remember tries are the real count or you know the you know basically how much speaking from the game you know game art design industry or a game you know characters they really refer to triangles all right notice you also have budgets here which is kind of cool so if you're working say like you're in a contest or something or you know your boss you're working in the game you know field uh, and your boss says okay you got to model this uh, whatever it's I'm just roughly throw a number out there you, you have to model some kind of character and your budget is only you know 7,000 polys for all, you know all budgets within the scene so if you have that this will start to let you know you know when you start adding here let me uh here I'm just gonna ring an edge and connect it like quite a few times here notice my counts going up see I'm getting all these polys notice the count is going up 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 and I'm getting in my danger zone so it's let me know hey 
you're running out of, uh, you know, it's keeping track of your poly count. So it's going to let you know if you're going over your budget. All right, I just want to throw that out there. Um, I don't know if that made any sense, but yeah, just let you know. Right here, seven, your hotkey to see your uh, whatever object you're selected on. Or your utilities panel here to more. And then you got, you know, polygon counter. Keep track of those. Those are kind of neat to, you know, be aware of. All right, let's um, let's let's talk about back to our polygon here. Uh, let's talk about uh, so those are polys. You know, those are our faces. We can grab multiple by holding Control, right, or just one, one at a time. All right, and then of course your element is the whole object itself, and this will make more sense as we go. Now your border here is an opening, so if I select poly, hit delete key, there is a hole in there. And the hole has to be somewhat closed off on all sides, so our verts are all welded, or you know, or our edges here. So that indicates that that's an opening of border, so if I grab the whole border, it selects the border of it. And then of course I can cap that off, you know, seal it back up. All right, um, and notice uh, you're probably looking, well, it doesn't look the same right here. That's just our smoothing forms, our, you know, smoothing groups. So if I were to highlight that, you know, let me just grab those faces, highlight these, see how I just grab those, and that one looks out of whack, or if you go down, you're in polygon form. If I go to um, smoothing groups here, I can turn them on. Notice none of them are checked, so I'm at all 45 degree angles. Or if I highlight them and hit one, it smooths them out. And that's how you do like low poly smoothing groups, you know. So you try to get rid of those faceted edges, you use your, you know, your smoothing groups right here. But for now, we're going to, you know, actually keep all those faces and turn them off at 45 degree angles. Look at it like that. All right, so that's the breakdown of, uh, you know, your vertex your edges, your borders, your polygons, and your elements. Now you're going to hear me reference this a lot. You got your vertexes, edge, poly, borders, polygons, and elements. Alright, one last trick I want to explain is, check it out, if I grab an edge and ring it, but I need to grab my polys instead, you know, I need to convert back to polys, or select the polys, you can hold down control and then you use these selections right here. So this is your verts, your edges, your borders, and your polys and elements. Same thing here, except for, I don't want you to get in the habit, a lot of students when they first start modeling, they start grabbing from here all the time. Technically, probably want to grab from here most of the time. And this is like kind of a backup secondary. So, for example, I'm going to grab my edges here. I'm going to ring it, but now if I hold down control and decide to invert it, basically, I can go, to, you know, oh, I want to grab the polys instead, so I select that, and now the polys are selected. If I need to go back to my edges, they're right there. Yeah. But see, now I grabbed all the edges. Maybe you didn't want that. So keep that in mind. This will make more sense as we go, especially when you do the P51 um, tutorials. All right. Um, all right. Uh, I think that's it. A breakdown of the edible poly here. And like I said, we're going to get learn all these tools as we go. And I will catch you next video. Alright, let's go 